Hi, good evening. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Um, welcome to the uh, speaker series on computational journalism. Um, I'm Nick Diakopoulos. Um, uh, we're very happy uh, this evening to be hosting um, several uh, panelists to talk about uh, computational storytelling and how that relates to the automated production of news. Um, before uh, we get started with that, I just wanted to sort of um, make a couple of um, uh, housekeeping announcements. So uh, if you're tweeting along tonight, uh, that the hashtag is Tau Talk, um, and you can follow uh, along the, um, with the Tau Center on Twitter, uh, at Tau Center, uh, if you want to uh, get in touch that way. Uh, for more information about other events that we organize, um, TauCenter.org online. Um, and uh, just, a, just a brief announcement for uh, one of the other uh, Tau projects that's going on. Um, Tau fellow Fergus Pitt asked me to make this announcement for um, a summer uh, course on sensor journalism that the Tau Center is hosting this summer. Uh, it's a paid course, so you're, you're paid $750 a week uh, to participate in um, learning about uh, sensors and how sensors can be used for journalistic purposes like reporting. Uh, and if you want to apply for that program, um, you should go to TauCenter.org and, and uh, look for the link um, about that program. Um, so uh, as I mentioned tonight, uh, the, the, the topic of the event is computational storytelling. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but, but we sort of named the event and then we're sort of seeing where it lands. Um, and uh, we have four panelists. I'll let, I'll let uh, our moderator introduce um, uh, the, the rest of the panel, but I'll just introduce the moderator briefly. Um, moderating for us tonight is uh, Reg Chua, who is the executive editor uh, of Editorial Operations, Data and Innovation at Thomson Reuters. Um, he oversees data and computational journalism at Reuters. Uh, including things like the Connected China Project, the graphics team. He also works with uh, corporate technology and R&D teams to develop newsroom systems and tools. Uh, in a previous life, he was editor-in-chief at the South China Morning Post. Uh, he worked at the Wall Street Journal for many years, uh, was the deputy managing editor uh, there, um, and, and did a lot of supervision uh, work there as well. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Reg. He can. Um, uh, sort of uh, introduce the rest of the team here. Uh, they're each going to do uh, a short presentation and then we'll go back to sort of more of a conversation discussion format at the end and open it up for questions. So thanks. Thanks, uh, Nick, and that's really embarrassing because I w really wasn't planning to introduce any of them at any length at all because I figured, you know, why are you here if you haven't read their bios, but okay. Uh, so anyway, very quickly, my name is Reg. You can tell that I'm not a computer scientist by the fact that I'm wearing a suit, and you can tell that I'm not a working journalist by the fact that I'm not wearing a suit. I have this incredibly long and useless title. I could not tell you what I actually do, but one of the best parts of my job is that I get to talk to people like this and figure out try to figure out what they're doing, and then try to bring their systems into the newsroom um, and, and see how they can help us produce news or, or, or uh, produce better news. So um, very quickly, and, and I really mean very quickly and none of that long intro, uh, we have uh, Ji uh, Chen Zhu, who's at Drexel University's College of Media Arts and Design and Department of Computer Science. So the one thing you'll find interesting is everybody here has got some kind of double-barreled uh, uh, title, which is also interesting because I think we're really talking much more about marrying two fields together. Uh, then we'll have uh, Mark Riddell, who's at Georgia Tech's School of Interactive Computing and the director of the Entertainment Intelligence Lab. <coughs> and then uh, our final speaker will be Larry uh, Birnbaum, who I'm sure I just managed to mangle your last name off, uh, who's uh, both at Northwestern University and a, a uh, co-founder of Narrative Science, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and the other interesting thing about Larry is that he's got two professorships. You've got a professor, you know, professor of electrical engineering and computer science and of journalism. So that you can't get much uh, more uh, sort of integrated than that. So all of them are going to talk about some really interesting work, storytelling, um, uh, fictional, non-fictional news games and, and, and things like that. Um, so I think that all of this is going to be a fairly 
a very interesting discussion. Um, from my point of view, sitting as sort of moderating the panel, one of the things I would like to try and bring some of the discussion back to, and I'm depending on all of you to help, um, is to talk through um, what this means in terms of benefits to, to you know, news, uh, benefits to end users, the society, to, to think through the use cases, um, and then sort of think through some of the issues as to how all this relates to journalism. Um, the notion of, of news judgment and, and who exercises it, where do we get it from, how do we em embed uh, journalistic judgment, if there's a difference between journalistic judgment and other types of news judgment, into algorithms that we then t uh, depend on to turn out stories, the role of a newsroom um, in a world where these capabilities are much more commonplace and how we integrate them and what happens to a newsroom once they are integrated and how newsrooms uh, will, will develop and so on. So, uh, so I'm counting on all of you to help me get all this right. But in the meantime, let's turn it over to our first presenter, Chi Chen. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Nick for organizing this wonderful panel and for Rich to moderate the rest of the discussion. I look forward to a stimulating evening for a lot of things that we have in common, or maybe not in common. We'll find out soon. Um, so I'll be talking about computational narrative. But my focus of today's talk is I want to talk about how computers make decisions about the story or the future story we are going to be able to tell. And as, I, as Rich introduced, my name is Ji Chen Zhu, and I'm from Drexel University. So computational narrative is an area of research that tries to figure out ways of using computer algorithms to analyze structure and generate stories. This is a large field, and for me, my particular interest in this area is how or whether we can make computational narrative into a medium for cultural expression. The reason I put the question mark there, if you notice, is that it's still an open question in terms of whether computational narrative is a new form of expression that allow us to tell stories in ways that we could not before, or is, are we telling the same kind of stories, but in ways that are faster, cheaper, better, or more often, two of those three. What is clear, though, is that along the way of computational narrative and each of its steps, there are many decisions that's being made either by the engineers who made those systems or by the computer itself. Some of those choices or decisions are editorial, others are aesthetic, or even ideological. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be talking, I'll be focusing on three types of, three types of ways in which biases are built into computers that can shape the stories we tell, such as at algorithms level, or at the level of how we represent data, knowledge, or information. And finally, in terms of how we make the system interactive and give player the freedom to choose the things they, still, they want to do while still preserving the facts about what we want to present. So along those three lines, I will present three of my projects. Each, both, all three of them are text-based. So the first one is associative computational narrative. So now let me first take you to the beginning of story generation systems. In 1976, um, Miha made this, uh, this story generation system called Tailspin, which is able to generate a variety of stories. So here is one of the examples. All those stories, they vary in terms, of the, in terms of the characters, in terms of the actual stories, but most of them follows a particular pattern of storytelling, which is that you have a main character. In this case, Joe the Bear is the character. He or she will have initial state. In this case, he's hungry. And therefore, it gives him a goal, an end goal for the story, which is he wants to find some honey so that he won't be hungry anymore. The rest of the story, is usually this main character goes around in his story world performing different actions so that he can reach his final goal. So the reason why this type of story shows up in the beginning of a computational narrative, I would argue, is not an aesthetic choice. But rather, it is because this kind of story lends itself very well to the kind of operations, to the operation of an extremely influential family of algorithms called automatic planning. So in planning, 
when the system is given the input of initial state of agent and the goal state of where we want agent to go, this algorithm is able to figure out a sequence of action or sequences of actions that will lead the agent from the initial state to the goal state. Of course, using planning to generate stories is a difficult problem with many useful applications. But from the point of view of the type of story it can generate, they tend to be very goal-driven and also action-based. And I also like to argue these choices are not made by either the computer scientists who program these systems or the other writers who work with them, but rather the moment that you pick algorithms such as planning is the thing that you're going to use, those aesthetic choices or narrative choices are made for you. So it is building in those algorithms. What I'm interested in is expanding the range of stories that we can tell through computational narrative. For example, is it possible for us to go from causality-based storytelling, which is the case the character needs to go from one action to another in order to cause the final goal to happen? Is there a way that we can switch to association or using association as a way to chain narrative events together and still be able to tell an interesting or maybe powerful story? So I was, re I was recently watching this documentary, and I used this as an example here. So when Rachel Mad Maddow introduces Hubris, a documentary about the Iraq War, she first started talking about the Vietnam War and how the US got involved based on partial or misinformation. And the association that she makes may creates this powerful framing for the documentary about the Iraq War it also sets a higher goal for the entire program for not only to, co to uncover what happened in this particular case of the Iraq War, but also how can we prevent history from repeating itself yet again. So my interest in using association lead to a project called REAL. It is a text-based um, computational narrative system where we looked into another group of AI algorithms called computational analogy, and we use that to try to create stories that connects two separate worlds. And in our particular case, we're interested in connect character's external world, the kind of things that he does, and the internal world of the character, of memories, of emotions, so on and so forth. So I don't have time to go into the details of the system, but I'd like to say two, thing, one, two things I want to, hi uh, want to highlight. It is, there are two ways we use computational analogy to tell the story. The first one is to retrieve similar stories as past memories of the character, if it is similar enough to the current situation at hand. So I'm going to show you a terribly written story. Hopefully the idea is not to show how bad a writer I am, but also to showcase some of the things the system, the technology behind it is capable of doing. So in this case, the main character is on the street where he saw a cat in front of him. And what you see here in the red frame is a memory that's retrieved by the system automatically from a repertoire of other memories. The second use of computational analogy that we made is what we call imaginative projection, which in this case is to project what might happen in the future based on what happened in the past. So going back to the example that I showed, later, I showed earlier, so once the player makes a choice that he wants to play with the cat he encountered in the first place, and because the recent memory that was retrieved have a similar animal inside of it, which died at the end, leaving the, the main character really sad, the system is able to project that if the main character plays with this cat that's in front of him, the same thing will happen. So the cat, the cat might die, which will leave him very sad. So it becomes something that he wants to avoid. So we arrive at the first building bias in terms of how computers shape the story that we tell. In my case, the way of, the way of associated storytelling through memories and projections are afforded by the underlying algorithms we choose. And because algorithms are usually hidden from the end user, these biases are usually hard to see from the outside. So let me switch um, my discussion a little bit 
And my second um, line of research that we discuss is about narrative information extraction. So one of the things that we learned in the real project is, first, writing a good story is hard. But second, representing these stories in ways computers can process also takes a lot of time. Just to give you an idea, to represent a single sentence that's at the bottom of the screen, we need to hand code all this information above it. And worse, since this data are represented in such a way that's tailored to our particular system, it is not clear whether it can be used by other storytelling systems, such as the ones Larry or Mark is making. So we, thought to, we, we said to ourselves, well, there is no shortage of good stories in the world. Is it possible, or what if computers can extract information directly from this text so that our system can use them rather than having us write the stories from scratch and then hand annotate them? Well, of course, information extraction and natural language processing has been an active research field for the past decades. But what we want to do is to link the information that we can extract from those texts from the linguistic level and trying to reason about the quality or the, or the properties of those stories at the narrative level. So to, that, to do that, we started with defining a group of stories where there has been established theory in terms of how they are structured. And in our case, we chose to look at a, a, a series of unannotated Russian folk tales translating into English. And the narrative theory that we build a system upon is props narrative theory. So again, I don't have the time to go into more detail, but one of the things that we're currently doing is how can we extract from the text who are the characters in those stories from the text, and what roles do they play according to props theory. So the roles here I'm talking about villains, um, heroes, or princess, so on and so forth. So a challenge here is this information are usually this, inf this information is usually not explicit. A character can be a human, an animal, and in our domain, very often they are inanimate objects. And the word of villain or hero almost never occurs in our corpus. To be able to make our computers able to extract these informations and reason about this, we found ourselves frequently making the decision about what type of knowledge we want to incorporate in our system so that the computer can make that kind of, make this kind of extraction. Some of these decisions or information we encode in our system are straightforward. For example, an entity that talks is more likely to be a character in a story. But others can be more tricky. For example, we have a feature that detects the quote-unquote human qualities about entities in the text. Such qualities include the ability to feel, love, walk, speak, talk, learn, play, live, think, and you can like the last one, to read. And then, once we build this kind of knowledge, we use a knowledge base called ConceptNet to determine whether the entities have any of these qualities or have anything that's associated with these qualities. And just a side note, in the latest version, we added a new ability, which is to be able to cry as another defining quality of humanity. <coughs> so here I arrived at number two building bias of system, of computers, which is data, and particularly in what ways we can knowledge, how do we represent these knowledges, informations in our system? Well, our system works. In the most recent experiments, we reached more than 90% of accuracy in terms of identifying who or what are characters in the stories. But it eases me a little to say, to find that computer scientists are putting the to put into the position of power to decide what are human qualities and what are not. Even more unsettling is those decisions are made uh, or distribute, uh, not really distributed as a manifesto for public debate, but rather it's embedded as numbers and functions along many thousands of lines of other codes. Thankfully, our system, at least at the moment, is not going to affect the lives of people outside, besides my grad students and a couple of academics who's gonna read my papers. 
but similar kind of decisions are being made every day by companies such as Google, Amazon, Netflix, and they influence the life of millions of people. And third, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we call interactive nonfiction. There are many differences between fictional and factual stories, and most of my project focuses on the first kind. And when we throw interactivity into the mix, I find the distinction between the two even more complicated. So at the heart of interactive storytelling, whether it's computer games, or I'm here using a precursor of interactive story, storytelling, which is this series of books called Choose Your Own Adventure books. At the heart of all of this is essentially about parallel universes, if you think of it that way. So when a player makes choice, he or she is essentially choosing among the many possibilities of how the story might unfold and choose which one to proceed and, and propel the story that way. And this, I would say, is part of the joy of playing interactive storytelling games, which is to say that you are making those decisions that will matter, that will change the life or change the experience of your main character. However, facts only happen in one way. When we try to map something that's like this, for instance, something that happened caused the second thing, which caused another thing, that already happened. When we try to map that to a branching structure, of the many possibilities afforded by interactive storytelling. What does it mean? So with that question, I worked with a very talented journalism student, and we experimented in terms of how we can still give readers the agency to interact while still sticking to the fact. We prototyped what we called an interactive nonfiction system, where we used comprehensive interview notes of a published traditional news story. The reporting in this system is framed with a format which we call roundtable. So after a traditional nut graph, the reader is presented with a list of source, list of sources including their names, um, their title, a small quote regarding their position on the main topic being discussed in the news story. And then the reader can read, can choose in terms of who to talk to and forward lens. So in other words, the third building bias that computer can shape our story is how we introduce or how we frame interactivity. What kind of freedom, in what form are we allowing the, the, the reader to have? For example, in the interactive non-fiction um, system we build, one of the things that we felt important is to keep the neutrality of the reporting while still giving user the option of choosing how does she or he want to perceive in this, in this world. So one of, the, one of the solutions or options we come up with is when a system detects a reader is only engaging sources from one particular side of the argument, the system will try to remind her, to to remind her the existence of the other side. Here are just one of the many options that could be done in this case. So in summary, I think there's a lot of common ground between computational narrative and computational journalism. We can and we should learn from each other. And I hope some of my reflections from more of the computational narrative side can be used for to, as a starting point of our conversation tonight. And also hope and make it clear somewhat why procedural literacy, which is the ability to see computer, how it functions at all these level of algorithm, data representation, and the interactivity is an important skill for citizens, for all citizens of the 21st century, including journalists. Thank you. My name is Mark Riddell. I'm an associate professor at Georgia Tech, and it's a pleasure to come here and, and be able to talk to you people. Um, Ji Chen stole half my talk, um, but that's fine. I was planning on speaking for 30 minutes, but I've told you I only had 15 minutes. Anyways, so this might work out in your favor as well. And, and but what I'm really going to talk about is, is in similar lines, um, how can computers, artificial intelligence in particular, 
generate stories, particularly generate stories from scratch. I'm particularly interested in um, computational creativity, the question of whether computers can be creative, the same way we think about actors and artists and authors as being creative. And in this pursuit of what you might think of as, as human-level artificial intelligence, there's many ways of going about it, I focus predominantly on this question of whether computers can generate stories. And I think storytelling interactive narrative and all these things are very interesting for, for lots of reasons, one of which is that psychologists tell us that um, humans often, often exhibit what we might refer to as narrative intelligence, which is this set of cognitive tools that, we, that come into play when we experience and we think about narrative. So the way we ex organize our memories in terms of narrative, how we explain our memories and our thoughts in narrative terms, how we comprehend when other people tell us stories, when we have effective responses to stories, like the feeling of suspense that we feel when we're uh, watching a movie or reading a book, and how we make up new uh, fictional stories. We make up our own story, um, fairy tales, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the goals in my research has been to instill computational systems with its narrative intelligence and kind of see where that can take us. So I'm particularly interested, and I do believe that if we can build narrative intelligence into computers, then they can do some really amazing things. Like they can be better entertainers, they can be edu better educators, they can be better communicators because that's how we communicate with each other in a more natural sort of way. And in, in terms of the things I've been doing in terms of story generation, there's lots of different things that we can uh, use this for. One is just you know, the, the broader question of can we generate a storybook, right? Printing out text that people will be able to read, enjoy, take with them, think about, so on and so forth. Don't worry about reading that, it's very poor. <laughs> um, but then as Jichen got into this, we can also put these stories into virtual worlds. And once the computer is able to change the stories on the fly, we can now become characters in these stories. And when we decide to do things that we want to do um, differently from maybe the original authors, then the story can adapt and flex and change along with us. And we can use this in terms of um, entertainment, computer games, but also training and education as well. And then finally, there's a, some interesting studies that are coming out now that show that uh, when virtual characters, these animated agents that you see, are able to understand stories and tell stories, they become more lifelike, they become more real to us. And we're able to build rapport and build relationships with these characters in ways that we might never have been able to do before. So now they can become not just companions, but they can be health coaches and many other things along those lines. So there's many different perspectives in how we might achieve or go about uh, building systems that can build stories to create stories. And when I'm talking about story generation, I'm talking about the automatic creation of a meaningful sequence of events. I just want to kind of throw out a couple different ways of thinking about this problem. I've only focused on some of these, but um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of a taxonomy that will help us think about this as we go forward into discussion. Um, and really, I think the two ways we might think about this is fabricating and finding. So fabrication to me is the making up of fictional stories from scratch. So things that have never existed in the real world before, the computer has to come up with them and present them. Finding is taking, say, historical traces or data traces and then picking and choosing the bits out of them that we can assemble into something that will have meaning that we can tell to other people. So let's say taking all my life's history, my memories, and figuring out what I actually want to tell you as an interesting, useful vignette along the way. And then approaching these two types of story generation, we can also have two different types of goals. Uh, we can think about fabricating or finding common stories, or fabricating or finding fantastical stories. And by fabricating common stories, for example, we might think of, um, can we build a system that can create a story about robbing a bank, for example? Something that it will make a sequence of events that if we were to read, we would recognize and understand it to be a, a form of or a canonical example of robbing a bank, whatever that happens to be. And then fantastical is, is the things that we see in, in theater, right? So um, Christopher Nolan's uh, bank robbery from The Dark Knight with uh, the Joker doing some really kind of crazy stuff, right? The sort of thing that you know only exists only in that one movie you'd never really kind of think of, but you see it and it's amazing, right? This is the high goal uh, of, of, um, of creative systems that we might achieve. And in terms of finding, you might think of, um, well, Maybe in terms of uh, sports, for example, I assume we're going to be getting into sports a little bit later. You know, there might be certain patterns or things that we want to see from large traces of data of, of actual story, stories and events that have happened. So can we find the coming from behind victory stories from, from the trace of all the sports games that have been played? And then fantastical things are the things you'd never think to think of or to look for, but are just these kind of truly amazing sorts of things. So the example I'm using here is a uh, come from behind victory of Auburn versus Georgia 
and I, do you guys play football up here? I don't know. But um, <laughs> so it was um, the last few seconds, Auburn was behind. They threw a Hail Mary pass all the way down the field, just in hopes that they'll score. It gets intercepted by Georgia, who then fumbles it into the hands of the original receiver, who then goes, scores a touchdown in the last seconds, wins the game. Um, I like telling that story because Georgia Tech and Georgia have this rivalry, and I get to make fun of Georgia with, in public, which is great. But this is the sort of thing that's just totally amazing and totally bizarre. It's going to make the highlight real, but you've never really kind of had a, a pattern for that. You never think about you know, a double Hail, uh, Hail Mary fumble combination ahead of time. But when it happens, you, you want to know about it. And the key to building all these things, no matter which perspective you take, are really kind of two parts, and Ji-Chen really touched on these. One part is you have to have algorithms that can reason about these things and create these stories, but then these systems also have to have knowledge. So for example, they have to know what common things are, or what typical or stereotypical or canonical means, or the patterns that you might want to see. Because once you have those things, you also need to know how you can go beyond those things into the, the realm of fantasy and fantastical. So I'm going to touch mostly on this question of knowledge. I think this is the key element that through my uh, time working on these systems has become one of the most important things. How do these systems know what can go into stories and what stories need to be about? That information, this knowledge has to get into the computers somehow. And so as I mentioned, my real work is really in this area of uh, automated fabrication of stories. I'm particularly interested in whether we can build these intelligent systems that fabricate fictional stories. And I want these to be indistinguishable from the things that, we, that humans might write as well. And I'm also interested in going beyond this and say any system that I've built has to be able to tell a story about any conceivable topic they may want to do. Because we as humans can do that. I can ask any of you to tell me a story. And I can say, tell me a story about a particular topic. And you think for a few minutes, and you can do that. Traditionally, this is a very strange goal for an AI system who are often given one specific thing to do. Like a drive, a, an automated uh, car right, has one task it needs to do. Right? You do not want it thinking about Little Red Riding Hood. Right? But here we might want to tell stories about driving, about wolves capturing little girls, or robbing banks. Right? And I'm specifically going to focus on this work uh, um, on talking some about work on common sociocultural situations. So can I tell these common stories that you'll recognize as plausible things that might happen in the real world, but have actually never happened. And I want to think a little bit as we go forward is, well, how do humans do this? What can we learn from how humans tell stories? And I think the key insight when it comes to how humans create fan fantastical stories or just fictional stories is that we rely very heavily on our experiences, <coughs> that we've lived in this world for 20 or 30 or 40 years, however many it happens to be. And we've had a lot of experiences. We've built up a lot of knowledge about how the world works, and we can recombine it and use it dip into those memories in lots of different ways. Computer systems and AI systems don't have these lifetime experiences. They've existed for hours at best uh, from the minute you turn them on, right? So the question really is, if we're ever going to do this, can we get computers to have the equivalent of a lifetime of, of human experiences that they can dip into to make these stories? Uh, unfortunately, we have one kind of magic tool that's come out in the last few years, and that's something called crowdsourcing. Now, I've I assume most of you are familiar with crowdsourcing, but the basic notion is it's a set of computational tools and techniques and tricks and algorithms that we can use to basically take a large number of people on the World Wide Web and basically reconfigure and program them into a supercomputer that's able to do things and solve problems that AI has never been able to solve before. So the insight here is, well, if humans can learn from stories, maybe a computer should also be able to learn from humans the information it needs to know to in turn tell us new stories back to us. Right? So basically what I'm saying is maybe we can use a crowd to simulate a lifetime of experiences for our computer by having those people tell stories to the computer, build up that knowledge base, and let it use it. So a more technical geeky way of talking about this is we're going to basically going to crowdsource highly specialized corpuses of narrative examples and then run machine learning algorithms over it to learn about common activities. But if we can do this, we can basically automatically generate stories without any sort of a priori knowledge engineering that is often very expensive for humans and often <coughs> only solves a very small subset of problems you might be interested in. I won't get into too much uh, details, but basically we built a system around these ideas. The system is called Scheherazade. It basically has two parts. It learns these models and it tries to use them. So anytime you tell the system that you want to generate a story about something, it dips into its memories and says, do I know how to do these things that I need to be in my story? And if it doesn't, it goes back to the crowd and posts a query out to the internet through something like Mechanical Turk. Basically says, give me a bunch of examples of what it means to do this. So give me a bunch of examples of what happens when I go to a restaurant or when I go to a movie theater or when I rob a bank. 
And these stories are collected up. Because we're paying these people, we ask them to write in very simple English because I don't want to solve all of natural language processing, which I've heard is very hard. Um, we learn basically a model. We say, from all these stories I get, what are the common things that come up over and over and over again? They happen in certain orders. We basically build up a model, very similar to the way humans start to learn from their own experiences once you do something over and over and over again. And that builds up this memory. And this memory builds and builds and builds over time. Um, so without going into the details, I thought I'd show you a few of the results that we've been able to do over the last year or two. And we've done a few different domains. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is going to a fast food restaurant. And this is a model of going to this fast food restaurant that our system has learned. Uh, this is a visualization of the data structures. It's kind of gobbledygook here. But basically the idea here is the circles are main events or actions that can happen. And the arrows are temporal constraints. Basically says thing, certain things have to happen before other certain things. So for example, paying for food must happen only after you've taken out your wallet and you've placed the order, but you can take out your wallet and you can place your order in any particular <coughs> order. There's no constraint between those two things. Um, so, and I think if you were to look at this in a particular way, you'd say this kind of captures intuitively what you think about if you're going to a subway restaurant or something like that. And I think it's mostly correct and our studies have shown that it, it's fairly accurate. You can also see we've captured kind of two basic ways of going about it, right? Driving through versus walking in. And our system is able to basically do these branching <coughs> uh, variations. Uh, this is my favorite one. We asked, uh, we asked the system to tell us stories about going on a date to the movie theaters. And I think, again, if you were to look at this, you'll think it's intuitively light, right? There's lots of things going down here in the middle. This is my favorite part, though. This part, right? <laughs> so without any intention on our part, the system learned how to get to first base. And I don't know what the Turing test is all about, but if that's not it, then I don't know what it is. So I'm very proud of that. I also, didn't realize kissing was first base. I'll have to like oh, was it, calibrate is it, everything. Is it not first base? <laughs> We're being live streamed. I mean, careful. Well, it was for me, but I'm a computer scientist, so we take things very slow. So. <laughs> And then, just for kind of shits and giggles, we also did a bank robbery. It's a very complicated thing. There's apparently lots of different ways of robbing banks, but it can figure out all the different variations involving guns and notes, and so on and so forth. And once you have this knowledge, basically once you have this rich knowledge structures in your system, then you're able to tell lots and lots of different variations of those things, even ones that have never been told before, basically by recombining people's crowdsourced stories into novel ones that have never existed before. And I won't get into the details about how we generate the stories, but we've done studies that basically show that the things that we can generate, again, for very simple, common, everyday sorts of scenarios, uh, stories that are indistinguishable from human authored stories, which I think is also a, a very encouraging uh, a sort of thing. Uh, this is the sort of story we get. Um, there's only one extra thing I need to tell you about this here, is that um, the data we get from the crowd is very kind of straightforward, very terse sort of language. So we actually went back to the crowd. We asked them to elaborate on the stories, give us more interesting, colorful uh, descriptions of these particular events. And then we dipped into the, that text and picked and chose the, and ordered the stories, uh, the sentences in the story. And you can work through it. It's mostly correct. There's a few ordering things. Again, you can see that there's this kind of dramatic uh, kissing event at the very end, which again, I'm very proud of. Um, but I'm actually going to stop there. I don't want to go into too much details about my own work. Um, there, are, there are a few research challenges that, that have to be addressed. There's many, actually. I don't think we're very close to human level storytelling, actually, as it is. But in particular, in terms of um, the questions that we might be looking at tonight in terms of journalism, uh, there are three things that came to my mind, at least. Um, and the first is discourse generation. So this notion that if you know what story you want to tell, there's still lots of different ways of telling it. If you have kind of a goal of explanation or, or exposition, you know, what are the things that you need to do um, to basically convey that information to an audience? It's a lot more than what I've just shown here, which is just kind of picking events and picking actions and putting them in the right order and ascribing text to them. Uh, there's a lot of things that you have to do in terms of rhetorical structure, in terms of uh, communicative goals that decompose into other communicative goals. And if you get those in the right order, people understand. If you don't, they don't understand. You have this additional challenge that um, if you need your explanations or your communication to fit the data, that you have available. Uh, we need to make intelligent choices that way. Or vice versa, uh, if you have the story that you want to tell, can you find the data that you need, need to use to corroborate? Um, there's also the question of finding stories. I've not worked directly on this issue. I've only worked on the fabrication aspects. But if we do want to find the stories, I do believe that the learned knowledge structures, the kinds that we showed up here, can be used potentially to dip into large corpora of text and basically say, is any given fragment of text, is there a probability that this is a bank robbery, or a restaurant, or a, a date. 
and, and be able to find stories in that particular way. Um, our results on this are not very good yet. Um, this is a very hard problem. We're still working on it. And then finally, I haven't really talked about this fantastical element, both either fabricating or, or finding fantastical stories, because we must take the knowledge that we've learned, that we've gathered, and extrapolate beyond it to make new knowledge that's never existed before. And we have to get that new knowledge right, in the sense that it should be not, not nonsensical and also believable or plausible. And that's a really hard problem. That's actually what I think, if you can solve that problem, you've solved creativity in general. And we'll have a few ideas of how to get forward there. This is kind of the big goal, the big vision, the sorts of things that, um, that we might want to achieve throughout. So I'm just going to leave that there. And um, I look forward to the discussion and questions that we might have going forward. So thank you very much. So I really feel like the practical Midwesterner. Um, you know, the, the, there's actually a lot of things I wrote down while I was listening to Ji Chen and to Mark that are actually quite kind of consistent in the way we're thinking about things, which may be actually hard to discern at first. So that's something we should be thinking about because I'm not really talking about writing creative stories. And um, in fact, actually, uh, I had an epiphany um, a couple of years ago about why things were starting to work better than they used to work for me and for us. And, I, and the realization I had was that, and this is going to sound so ridiculous, but that computers were not going to uh, talk to us until they had something to talk about and um, until they had something to say. They were not going to tell us stories. And the thing is that one of the great things about the way the world is changing and the scale of the, and the pace at which the world is changing is that the scale of data, the, the scale of things that computers can apprehend at some level has grown so extraordinarily large compared to what it once was that they really actually have a great deal to talk about. Um, anyway, the, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk a lot about the work we're doing at Narrative Science today, but I do want to start by saying today I'm here representing Northwestern University because much of what I have to say will be speculative. So, uh, but I will start with the practicality of it. Um, these are the data that narrative science will receive, in this case about a, um, a team, uh, uh, hockey teams playing in the Rio Grande Valley, and the system is not yet capable of thinking that there's something strange or ironic about hockey in the Rio Grande Valley, but, but maybe someday it'll get that too. And this is the story that our system writes um, from that. The Rio Grande Valley killer bees were firing on all cylinders against Laredo Bucks, and when the buzzer sounded, the killer bees emerged with a 6-3 to three win. And it goes on to talk more about this hockey game. Of course, we handle more than sports. We do business. These are the data from uh, a quarterly earnings preview. And this is the story that we write from about a quarterly earnings preview. And these are published in Forbes.com. Um, we've dabbled in medical things. These are data from an adverse events diary uh, for, a, um, for a, a, a patient in a clinical trial. And um, in fact, uh, the, the uh, drug companies are required to write um, reports based on these adverse events diaries. And so one question is, could we actually write some of these, some aspects of these reports automatically uh, based on the data that are contained in these adverse event diaries? Civic data, I think this is certainly going to be something that's very close to the heart of many people in this room. This is a project that we did with ProPublica where we took a data that they had, they had gathered or, or really collated from the government around 52,000 schools in the United States that allowed you to compare those schools and understand how they were performing vis-a-vis -vis the socioeconomic uh, um, indicators of the student population. And here's a, here's a story about Evanston Township High School, which is the high school in my hometown. Um, so we wrote 52,000 of these with, with, uh, with ProPublica. And unstructured data, too. This is something I think is really fun. This is a story that we wrote during the Republican primaries of uh, 2012 based on Twitter data. And in this case, uh, I want to make it clear that the system that we've developed, that the, the algorithms we've developed, write stories from structured numerical and quasi-numerical data. And of course, this is, Twitter is a good example of well-known unstructured data. But if you work a little bit, you can extract structure from the data. And, uh, and write a story from that. So here's a story we wrote. Newt Gingrich gains attention with hot-button topics, taxes, character issues. 
Uh, Newt Gingrich received the largest increase in tweets about him today. The Twitter activity associated with the candidate has shot up since yesterday, with most users tweeting about taxes and character issues. So the first paragraph is pretty, I would say, bread and butter. I think the second paragraph is actually pretty good. While the overall tone of the Gingrich tweets is positive, public opinion regarding the candidate and character issues is trending negatively. In particular, Mama Vickers says, someone needs to put the blood arm suspicious character to a photo montage of Newt Gingrich, and then there's a cute hashtag. So, um, and again, uh, this, this program was, this story was written entirely by machine. Why stories? And actually, I think uh, both Mark and Ji Chen alluded to this. This is actually a really critical point because for us, if we're going to generate stories, those stories have to actually satisfy the informational needs of readers. They have to actually convey understanding to the readers of the data that they're, we're trying to explain to them. And that's actually a, a critical point of commonality between what they were talking about and what I'm talking about here. So here's some data. And if, you, um, you know, if you're a financial expert, this will make sense to you. Actually, I'm maybe not a financial expert. If you know anything about finance, which I don't, this will make sense to you. Or I might show you this chart, in which case that might make sense, more sense to you. Or I might generate this. And in particular, uh, in the second paragraph, you might notice we say, while sales have increased, there has been a steady decrease in margins, which should be cause for concern. So the point about a story is that we want to make explicit the critical aspects of the data, not leave it to you to figure out what these are, but actually um, figure them out for you and tell them to you. Another way of saying this is you can't take a wall of data and turn that into a wall of text. The purpose of a story, even a relatively informative story like this, is to make, that, make those data meaningful in human terms, pull out what really matters and explain it to you in a way that will make sense to you. So my take on what Mark and Ji Chen were talking about when they talked about narrative intelligence or uh, structural models is a notion of, I, I should say our take, is, uh, is a notion of narrative analytics. In other words, stories embody these very high level patterns or themes that are efficiently communicated and effectively grasped. Come back, fade, low hanging fruit. I actually, uh, I think the, the stories about uh, princesses and dragons and villains absolutely fit this category and you could probably write a business story that way if you wanted to. Um, we haven't done that. Uh, they pick out, and what these themes do is they pick out and they connect and they summarize the critical aspects of the situation. They, they really highlight kind of what's there and they connect it and they make it coherent. They explain, they convey trends, causes, and even recommendations. They make the data meaningful. And that's what, these, that's what narrative intelligence allows you to do. That's what narrative analytics does and that's what we want a, sto a story to do. So very quickly the, uh, on the mechanisms that our systems use, we, we do a lot of data processing where we start with, of course, raw data and do a lot of um, um, statistical and numerical processing to sort of generate higher level derived features that are sort of meaningful in the category, uh, in the kind of category that you're talking about. And then we have these things called angles and that, those are these large narrative patterns I was talking about and that, that is named really in homage to the journalist's notion of an angle. What's your take on this? What's your viewpoint that's going to make this hang together? And then finally, again, as um, as both Mark and Ji Chen talked about, there has to be a rhetorical structure that's going to stru organize these angles into something that looks like a coherent story that can then be generated into language. Fundamentally, the issue in the end is, how, is, how, is what to say more than how to say it. Uh, the first prototype was developed at Northwestern uh, University. Um, it was called Stats Monkey. Um, it was actually, uh, I, I think, for since we're here, and I actually gave a talk this afternoon on sort of student projects. The original prototype was, was done in a projects class uh, um, and the work was supervised by me and my research partner Chris Hammond and um, uh, we had a number of fantastic students on that project, two of whom are still with the company, Nick Allen and John Templon, who were the co-inventors of this technology with us and they, by the way, were students in the Medill School of Journalism uh, when they helped us invent this technology. Uh, I'm going to show you the demo, but it, it's, um, um, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, I'll show you the demo. So these are the box score, the line score, and the, well, yeah, maybe I'm not going to show you the demo. <laughs> you know, do I know what I'm doing? Answer, no. Okay. Um, there we go. So this is the box score, the line score, and the play-by-play. -play. Well, you can't see the, there it is, there it is the play-by-play -play data. Um, and if we push this little button here, um, and some of you may have seen this particular example before because it's sort of my favorite from this era of the, of the system. Down to their last out, Griffey saves Mariners. 
uh, Seattle, the Chicago White Sox had the Seattle Mariners down to their final out, but Ken Griffey came through with a single to drive home the winning run in Seattle's one to nothing victory in a 14 inning marathon on Wednesday at Safeco Field. And we have a picture of Ken Griffey because we knew he was the most important player in the game. But the thing I want to make clear, again, is that um, sports are really not, I mean, we, we developed this originally in sports, but the fundamental idea is to actually take, is to think about explaining data in general and all kinds of content verticals that are important to people in a way that will actually make sense to them. Um, uh, this was really, this made us really happy. We got this XKCD comic. Um, of course, somebody had to explain to me what XKCD was, but hey, you know, I'm old. Uh, a lot of the idea, again, is to, go, is to think about uh, the flood of data that are coming at us. Maybe one of the best ways to look at what we're trying to do in this work is uh, all the data that are being gathered today, what is the point of gathering it if it is not going to be made understandable to people in a way that they can take decisions on? I mean, of course, much of it will be given directly to machines to take decisions, but in the end, I think we all uh, believe, and, or at least hope, that the most important decisions will be taken by people based on an understanding of these data. So in the final analysis, we must convey it to people in a way that they understand, financial data, so investment research reports for people, sector reporting is an obvious application area for the technology, so this is sort of stock market and, um, analytics, what's up and what's down. Business reporting, I really love this because, so those, th those data back there were the, these are the data from a, a large fast food franchise that generates point of sale data and they, and they can present these data to the managers of these organizations and and the thing is that they're busy people. So we thought, like, what can we do, to, what can we give to them that will actually, you know, be meaningful to them around these data, around their store? And um, the thing about this store that I want to emphasize is it really is meant for one person. It's an incredibly boring story, okay? Unless it's your restaurant, in which case it's an incredibly compelling story because it's telling you something that you want to know, okay? Um, and in fact, actually, we, one of the things we thought about in terms of narrative structure was what can we give people at the end of a story like this that's, you know, the, what's the, um, you know, what's the gift we can give them? And so we thought, can we tell the one thing that will make their life better this week? And what we thought was, let's find the one thing that they could do that inc could increase their profit the best this week. What's the most underperforming product with the highest margin compared to their peers that we could tell them about and say, hey, focus on this product. If you focus on this product, and do just a little bit more, just bring yourself up to where your peers are, you'll make this much more money per year. <coughs> education, again, this is an experiment we've done in looking at a data that you get from taking standardized tests during, um, during uh, test prep kinds of study work. Here's a project that we're doing now, which is to do, um, uh, to take Google Analytics data and turn those into reports for people who are, to, I mean, to people who care about how their website is doing. So, um, and then finally, something we were, we're excited about always because it touches people's hearts is the work we're doing with Game Changer, which is a, a company that has a, an, a smartphone scoring app for youth sports, and in particular, Little League Baseball, and it allows us to generate millions of, of stories like this for, you know, proud parents and grandparents about how their kids are doing in sports. And they're always doing well, by the way. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit again about something that I think connects a little bit, and I'm going to pivot and talk about something much more speculative because it, I think both Ji Chen and, and Mark emphasize this, is that right now when we think about editorial judgment, you know, it's something that's exercised by people when they write stories, when they just even decide what stories they're going to write in the first place, that's editorial judgment. How they're going to write them, where they're going to be placed, who will see them, whether they'll see them at all. And I think these are things that people generally view as uh, I think we understand them as consumers, at least, because we understand the brands uh, that, we're, that we're attending to. And I don't want to take a long time on this, but Bloomberg's editorial values are obviously uh, accurate and timely factual data about business and finance. The Atlantic and the New Yorker are seasoned, are, are sort of longer, broader issues, um, uh, people's cultural, you know, uh, issues around the culture done by seasoned, relatively objective people. Uh, you know, they have an editorial stance too, and uh, this already came up. What's their editorial stance? You know, what is it that they're, I mean, they're, they're choosing, you know, stories that you're going to see or not see, and, and they're, they're doing this on the basis of some editorial judgments, 
And I think the question is, what are the values? This is another, this is another uh, uh, algorithmic approach to editorial decision making. So again, I want to make the point that we've moved from you know, writing stories, which again involves some editorial judgment, to uh, presenting stories, to understanding what stories we're going to present to people. But again, there's an editorial judgment. And I guess the punchline for me is that I want these, uh, the editorial algorithms right now are being written in a variety of, based on a variety of factors that we, that, uh, um, uh, that we understand. Uh, uh, Nick was telling me today about one of Google's patents and Google News about factors it looks for to try and figure out whether a story is a more fact-rich or a more, uh, a, a more novel story. Um, but, um, but I think in the end, we want these editorial, these editorial algorithms to actually uh, use editorial categories that we understand as human beings that we can actually see what trade-offs they're making in terms of these editorial categories and understand why they're showing us what they're so showing. Maybe in the end, why are they telling us the story in the form that they're telling it to us? This is, this is completely speculative and notional. I would love to give readers and editors and algorithmic story generators an interface like this that says, you know, I understand that there's a trade-off between brevity and content or between timeliness and analysis and, and, and sort of help me understand as you give me a set of stories or as you, as you craft an individual story, how those trade-offs were being made in order to result in the content artifact that I see in front of me. So um, this is just a, a gleam in, in our eye, really, but this is, this is something I'd love to build. This is something we're going to have to work together to do because uh, what we need from uh, people in journalism and editors, writers, we need them to start thinking about articulating in a way that we can understand as engineers what are the categories that they're using. I mean, you people make decisions, <coughs> you people. <laughs> Some of the people in this room, you know, make decisions every single day, you know, professionally, you know, in, in writing and in editing, you know, probably almost without thinking about it. It's something you're experienced at, you know how to do it, you know, and the thing is that if we're going to build systems that are going to reflect those, va the values that you have and the judgments that you make, we're going to have to get a lot more explicit. We're going to have to do some cognitive therapy and kind of pull out what are those categories and understand how do we endow machines with these categories that they can actually make those kinds of decisions. And uh, again, sort of riffing off of something Ji, Ji Chen said, I mean, I want first class, uh, I want editorial models to be first class media objects. And what I mean by that is that they're not buried in thousands of lines of code. They're, they're publishable. They're things that people can write down and publish and read and understand and adapt and use and compare and critique, you know, and then adopt or not adopt, you know, in a ways that they could really understand. Um, so uh, with that, I'll end. I want to thank, of course, my colleagues and so many wonderful students I've had over the years and our funders, especially Knight Foundation, NSF, and Google. And uh, with that, thank you very much. So, God, that's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, and and it's, it's a little hard to sort of figure out where to start with. I mean, I, I sort of I jotted down notes throughout, and, and it really does sort of go everywhere. I guess a couple of things I had wanted to come back to was sort of the notion of what are the use cases for journalism. And, and Larry's obviously gone over that in great detail, but I, I'd love to hear from Ji Chen and Ma. Um, but also, um, you know, Ji Chen had raised um, sort of very early on the fact that, you know, the work that she does only affects, you know, grad students and some of the peop other people, whereas obviously the work that Larry does, you know, you get it wrong, that's a real, there's a real issue. And so there's a, there's a notion of sort of where we get to in accuracy and how, how much, you know, precision we need before we can start uh, uh, presenting this to people. There's the notion of transparency, which I think all of you have really sort of talked a little bit about what, you know, where do we get this information from, a bias and where we get knowledge. And, and so let me start with that and just sort of come back to your first, um, your first point about, you know, really this is more about what to say rather than how to say it. And, and I think it's reflected in, in, in all your work. Um, and one of the things that, that Larry had talked about was sort of, you know, getting editors, at least in the field of journalism, to explicitly articulate um, their news judgment. And I guess one of my questions is, do we need that? I mean, Mark's work in terms of essentially getting a crowd to, to just say what they do without actually even sort of thinking about it, without trying to draw this tree, um, allows you to get it. I mean, are we at the point where 
it's less important to be able to do that sort of thing. And, and, you know, and as you extract that, what does that mean in terms of the algorithm that you get and how clear is it to people? And you know, if, if perhaps, Mark, you could start and, and the others could riff on this a bit. Yeah, so I think um, interesting things happen when you put humans inside of your algorithm. So they're not only necessarily the users, the end users that read what you're doing, and they're not necessarily the, uh, let's say, the, the, the researchers or the designers that have built the system to do a particular thing, but now you have humans that are basically helping the computer to be able to do things they want to do. And I think as, as and you, so the algorithm loses, or the designer and the user at the end loses control of what happens as the, the product is being put together because the people who respond to the queries who are injecting their, uh, who you might think of as facts, so like what happens when you rob a bank, what happens when you go to a restaurant, who are injecting this information to your system are themselves, have um, perspectives, have attitudes, have beliefs and, and desires that are gonna manifest themselves explicitly or implicitly through what's happening. So um, Ji Chen talked a, little, a lot about um, bias in the data, right? There's bias in the algorithms, but there's bias in the data as well. So if certain types of people are responding to their system, your system can, in fact, skew one way or another. It could be um, in terms of sentiment. It could be in terms of cultural. So if I have, um, actually, an interesting point about the, uh, the, the movie example I had there, a lot of our data came from India. This <laughs> back forward? Towards me. OK, apparently I'm not talking into the microphone. So. Um, and, and movie theaters are just a little bit different there, right? And so actually our, our data was a little bit surprising to us, right? But we didn't have any control and we just kind of went with it, right? So um, now, but that also leads to interesting things, right? So can I select the demographic from which I mm -hmm. sample opinions or, or attitudes or information uh, from the crowd? Uh, should I make it more explicit in my system of, of what sorts of things I want to go to? I, and should I customize along those lines? as well. So there's a lot of um, interesting sorts of things that happen. And, then to, that, and but I, what I think that means is there's a lot more work that we have to do as scientists and, and end users and system developers to figure out how all these parts go together and how we can control the variables or release control of the variables when necessary. Let go. Let go. <laughs> Ari, do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, one of the things that, that we had done at, at Reuters is that we built a very s small, um, essentially proof of concept language generator, which essentially takes stories written by journalists on a very small and specific area, pump them through a machine learning system, and we generate, you know, three paragraph stories, which right. on, a, in, you know, on a blind taste test turn out to be more readable than the humans, which says something maybe about the humans. But, um, you know, so this notion of, you know, do, how, how explicitly do we need to articulate our news judgment? And if you're extracting information from current news judgment, what does that mean, you know, in terms of how stories might or might not evolve? Are we stuck in a point in time? So, I mean, I think that's a machine learning is a really apt thing to bring up here and crowdsourcing also because those are, I mean, it's a, a it's a, an attribute of that kind of technology, of AI technology, as opposed to other kinds, that sometimes the particular uh, factors that they're taking into account may not be incredibly clear. I mean, they're making judgments that people agree with, but how they're making those judgments, it's, it's sometimes hard to discern exactly what are the factors that they're, that they're looking at. Um, and I'm not really sure, I, I, I guess my feeling about this is that, that, that even in those situations, there are sort of categories of trade-off, maybe that's the way to characterize this, that I think that really matters. So if we go to a completely different uh, domain, like uh, a car that drives itself that you're sitting in, you know, there's a lot of thresholds that got set and there's a lot of stuff down there that basically ended up trading off, roughly speaking, whether the thing would move at all to how certain it was that, um, that there was nothing in front of it, for example. I mean, there, that's just going to be the case, that there will be trade-offs around, around those things. And I, for one, would really be more comfortable if I knew at least where those trade-offs were being made, even if I'm not really sure exactly how they were being made you know, that I had some understanding of, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I love the idea of having some level of control over that as, a, as an end user when I get in the car, you know, of, um, you know, trading off safety versus speed, for example, uh, you know, if, if that's a thing to do. I mean, because it's, it's going to be set by somebody. It really is. I mean, somewhere in the system that's happening, and, and I think it would be better for us all if at least we understood what that was. I, I agree that it's a hard challenge. 
Can I chime in yeah. a little bit? I would like to add a different, sort of slightly different perspective. I think one of the difference I can see from the work I presented versus the ones that Mark and Larry presented is, to me, I think maybe there is a difference in terms of what are we striving for? Is it for this generalizability or it's more sort of like um, particularity for the lack of better words? Right, for me, like if computational story in the sense is a cultural expression, I may not be as interested how everyone as a as a whole, a whole culture for instance, walks into a movie theater or a restaurant and what might happen, what are the typical things that will happen. I mean there is useful information there too. But from sort of the more of the expression point of view, I'm speaking more from the point of view of designer or maybe as a uh, as a storyteller, I'm more interested in what maybe what does it look like for or what it would be like if Jack Nicholson walks into a restaurant and the kind of things might happen versus what walking Phoenix will walk, walk into a restaurant the kind of things will happen and then sort of going back to the early issue that I come up with to me it's both in terms of what we're telling as well as how we're telling it maybe the story tell the story that comes from my perspective will be very different from both of your perspective and to me it's important to capture both I think that's one of the the difference. I think I'm right. no, I, I, sidetracking I, I, a little bit. No, no, no. I, I think it's a it's a good sidetrack. Yeah. yeah, and then so AI is in the eye of the beholder, right? So if you don't recognize the intelligence behind the system, then it's hard. So so oftentimes in artificial intelligence, you want the computer to kind of explain itself. And I think this gets back to what you're talking about. You're basically talking about uh, scrutability. Can you inspect mm -hmm. the data and how it's being processed? And that's very <laughs> hard with uh, many of these algorithms. Especially the machine learning ones, where right. where like sometimes even the scientists don't really understand the conclusions right. that, that that you're getting. And but knowing those trade-offs are a very important thing. So I think about the example of the restaurant that you're talking about and the recommendation it makes at the end. Uh, focus more on this uh, particular right. product. And if you don't understand why it's making that recommendation, I presume you try to explain it to some extent. There's the fear that you either dismiss it. Or what's possibly even more dangerous is you take that advice blindly and you follow it to, to your own destruction, right? If it turned out to be bad advice. So I think one challenge we have is how do we let people who are not AI researchers, who are not AI scientists, not computer scientists, be able to reverse engineer the thought processes of the AI, whether the AI explains itself explicitly or provides some sort of mechanism to dig in deeper. And so just to take that point, which, which you know, is slightly off point, but is a really interesting question. Um, again, I mean, on that, on that restaurant advice, and you can argue that, um, you know, it, well, it is earth shattering for that restaurant owner, but, you know, it, it talks more to the point of when it's in a story that you're really sort of embedding a bias in the story that, you know, the most important thing is X or Y or whatever it is. I, I mean, look, absolutely, because it's, it was, uh, it was aimed on the notion of is there a short? It, it was about short-term tactics. It was not a strategic piece right. of advice. Absolutely. Yes. So better food or whatever. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. It was yeah. absolutely tactical. It was like what's the lo what's the easiest piece of low-hanging fruit? That's the low-hanging fruit theme right there. What was the easiest piece of low-hanging fruit that you could pluck this week to make your life better? And you know we can raise the issue of is that how to build a business? Maybe it's not the way to build a business is to pluck this week's low-hanging fruit. Maybe that's. Maybe there are different models altogether of how one would want to go about doing that. Um, you know, I mean, you'll notice it wasn't really phrased quite as an advisory. It was phrased as, here's something, here's a thing you should know about. And, um, and I think partly it was for that reason that we thought that the, 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 uh, the owner in the end is the person who's, the, who's in the best position to know, do they want to act on this or not? It, was, it didn't say do this. It said notice the following thing. And, 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 and what are the implications of it? I mean, so, but, I, but absolutely. So, so, so let's just, um, if, I, if, you, if, if you don't mind, digress a little bit, because I know Nick's been working on the notion of algorithmic accountability and how um, journalism should be tracking algorithms that exist in the world. You know, here we're talking about journalists using algorithms if right. this thing scales nicely. Um, so. You know, and we all understand the difficulties. You, publishing the code doesn't actually help anybody because they don't understand it. So what do we do or what can we do in terms of greater transparency beyond, you know, sort of toggles that say, well, we, we, you know, we, we prime this car for speed, not for, you know, you still, have to, you still have to accept that that's the way the algorithm really is built. I mean, you, you talk about the bias in algorithms. How do we expose it to people in a way that they can understand? To me, I think it's a two-way street, right? Like, I think there is a need, as I said at the end of my presentation, there is a need for computational literacy. I think especially in today's world, even if you will not be able to 
sort of understand the specific code, but in terms of what are the main things that the particular algorithm is able to do or not able to do is biased towards, I think it's a really good starting point. And of course, on the other side of the computer scientist side, I think it is definitely needed in terms of to make the code more public in a way that's more accessible, but also working with experts in the field. So it's the, the decisions that we make is not just purely based on the technology in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of other things that may be addressing. Well, and I think there's um, that, that's a very important part. And I think you know when you when you hear the NSF talk, uh, Jeanette Wing, when she used to talk, you know this very core cognitive you know problem solving ability that that she wants to push as an agenda. But I think the algorithms themselves could also potentially be part of the solution as well. So you know, is it possible? I don't know for the algorithm to use its storytelling ability to tell the story about how it came up with its results. And I don't know if it can kind of reflect and introspect on that itself. I think that's a big open challenge that, that not many people have looked at it uh, very much. It's particularly problematic in some of these statistical systems where, where the AI is a line of, of math, right? And you can't just kind of tell a story about math. But algorithms can also do counterfactuals, which is a type of storytelling. Well, if the data was different, <coughs> just 3% different this way, then this is what might have happened, but if it was three percent different the other way, this is what might have happened instead. And then you at least you know you have three data points of comparison. You can now compare and make your own judgments as to which of those worlds is the best one, the right one, or or, or the the most interesting one. I mean, I think those are uh, both really good points. I mean, I think sometimes you can tell a story about math actually. So that's one one thing. But 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 you're absolutely right. Perturbation analysis is a really good example of something that you could talk about where what you're going to be getting at is, you know, how stable is this result? I mean, that's why people care about that. And, and so um, if you say, look, I changed a little bit and the whole everything changed, you know, then, you know, for a sporting event, that's probably right. That's probably what makes it exciting. But for a, um, for a, a business decision, maybe not so much, you know? I mean, so I think I, I, that, that's absolutely right. I did want to respond to one thing, Reg, that you said about how do I trust it? So, okay, you gave me these dials and these controls, how do I trust them? And you're right that, that um, there is gonna be an issue of how do they get cashed out in terms of actual algorithmics and data. But on the other hand, if you give them to people, they can fool, this is the perturbation analysis again, they can fool around with them themselves and see, mm -hmm. hey, is this thing behaving the way I would have expected it to, is it, you know, and as they play with it, I think that that's how they, I think perturbation is a great way to, 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 for a, a system to earn trust. I mean, you change it, you, you, you change its inputs and you say, hey, do, I, do these results still make sense to me? And I think that um, giving people the right dimensions of input to control might be one path towards trust, I guess. That's a, I, it's a very interesting point. And, and also would point out, of course, that when you have humans, how do you trust them either? So it's not, you know, we're not moving from a perfect state to an imperfect state. So let me, let me take that, um, I can't pronounce, but I'll say counterfactuals because it's much easier. Um, and, and sort of run down a, a, the, the question I did want to come back to on use cases, and then I'll turn it over to the floor, which is that's one kind of new use case that we don't actually see a lot of. Um, you know, and, and I think it comes back right to the beginning to Ji Chen's first question, are we telling the same kinds of stories? Are we telling different kinds of stories? So given this capability, and assuming we had this capability, um, you know, what are, what are the real fresh, new, useful use cases that we could, we could turn to that help the mission of journalism? What, you know, what, what do you see we could do beyond doing what we do, but doing it at scale and, and so on? Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> well, I think we're, um, you know, I think uh, we're getting a, a good sense now of, of you know, we're in, in a world of big data, massive data, and there, there's a much greater and greater desire to actually be able to understand the data. And, and we're getting a sense of how we can turn data into things that we can easily digest and understand by tapping into our people's narrative intelligence. But we're also starting to see something just in the news right now that I think is an interesting use case of these counterfactuals, which is what's happening with uh, the Malaysian air. You know, where a lot of people are going on the air and they're speculating, right? Well, this could happen and that can happen. We're exploring different hypotheses. We're tracking down the facts that might prove or disprove those things. And that's kind of a, I don't know if this is kind of a real time sort of journalism or if it's a new time, I don't think it's a new type of journalism. But this taps into the notion that people are do, doing creative exploration and they're kind of trying to explain how they understand the world. 
And is there a role in that sort of counterfactual speculative hypothesis mm -hmm. generation for uh, computational systems? And the answer right now is no, because our systems are not smart enough to kind of go beyond the data they've been given. But humans, that's exactly what humans are good at. And, and maybe the answer is yes, it may help. Maybe the answer is, is no, this is something that should stay uniquely human. But I think it's an interesting question to ask. Yeah. I mean, I guess the one thing, I, there's two things I want to say. One is that around that, the idea of the, the speculation, I think, you know, if the data aren't there, it would be great for the system to say, hey, where can I go find that data? You know, maybe, maybe there's a place I can go look for it, or for that matter, if I can come up with a crisp enough formulation, maybe somebody, go try and find data around this. This would help resolve this question. I mean, even or, if or build it backwards, right? Yeah. If, I, if I wrote, and I realize I've just completely invented a new capability, but if I wrote the story that said it went this way, what is the data that would be needed to prove Absolutely. this story? Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and you exactly. don't have to find it. You just have to say, well, now you have to find these five pieces right. these that will make it true. true for it to be Absolutely true. Absolutely right. So it becomes sort of part of the investigative <laughs> reporter in a certain sense, hypothesizing, right. you know, here's where I think the story's going, and, you, and these are the facts I'll need to support that. I'm sure I should start looking for those. Um, I think from a practical perspective, you know, uh, I, I mean, the way um, we look at it is that we have a toolkit right now that we can use to write these stories, and um, it's not quite ready for putting in the hands of journalism students, for example, um, or, um, or uh, let's, take, let's take that. And that's something I think that we would eventually love to do, to have the tool set be driven down to a level of, of abstraction, on the one, driven up to a level of abstraction on the one hand in terms of the kinds of categories it uses and down to a level of sort of simplicity as a result of that, that, that it becomes pretty easily manipulable by people outside of our company so that we can give it to folks. Because, you know, we can't, there's a ton of, data out there that we'd love to have stories written about that we're not going to write about, but if we can make the tool set available, people will, you know, adapt it to write the stories that they need written, so. Let me open it up to the floor, because I've been hogging this for a while. Is, are there any questions from the floor? Um, I think you need to run to the mic, um, so that the NSA can uh, remember who you are. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a software guy, so one of the aspects that none of you have really addressed that definitely will happen is from the user perspective, it would be good if there was some system, you know, something that one of your companies would build that is the journalist so that it is responsible for filtering things that I, I'm, I would be interested in and sort of like a... Uh, I would go from web page to web page or newspaper to whatever, and th this avatar who would go wherever I would be exposed to the web would know my history of viewing so that it wouldn't tell me the same story. It would tell me the stories I'd be interested in. So sort of like a, an assistant that's doing the journalism aspects for me that delivers, you know, it fights through this big data question as well. I'm trying to understand your question better. So, so are you suggesting sort of a more anthropomorphized version of Google News or Amazon or Netflix? Mm -hmm. Or is it more things that we are talking about here? The, the delivery should be more individual based on the person viewing, not necessarily the publisher. Right. So, so the data, I mean, so we leave traces every time we go through the internet of where we've been um, and what we've looked at. So the idea that this should be remembered and it should be able to gauge your interests um, or at least know the things you've seen, right? Because you don't want to say, well, here's a news article, but I've just seen a similar news article. So uh, in some ways, it's an it's a manage uh, expectation management. I don't want to tell you the things you already know. I want to tell you the things that are surprising. How does the system learn what's surprising? Well, if it has rich histories of the things you've done, and some model of your expectations, uh, perhaps like simple psychological models. I don't think it has to be deep psychological models. Um, it, this can be done. And there's actually, um, there's work that's being done in lots of different places in my lab and other places of trying to do this user modeling, uh, basically uh, of kind of statistically guessing your preferences and your interests and your attitudes about things. 
Um, I, it's coming, I, and I think it'll be here in the next few years, and the question would be how can we use it to our advantage? Can I try to break that down into sort of three steps and maybe have you all uh, uh, come back to that? So, I mean, one of that is sort of user modeling, sort of understanding your general preferences. You, you're interested in football, but not soccer. You want this, but not that, and you're from, you know, wherever. Um, so that, you know, sort of exists at the level of Google News and, and certainly Amazon. Um, then the second one is sort of the creation of events uh, for you in sort of very specific things because it's not just, um, you know, it's not just that you're interested in soccer, but you're interested in Manchester United and, and you want to know exactly that or it's your portfolio. And then I think the third interesting one is the level of credibility because again, um, that earlier uh, statement, you know, when, you, when you deal with an avatar on a computer, you have higher trust. Would, would Amazon sell more goods if they had a, a, a guy pop up and say, gee, I noticed you just bought, you know, whatever, and wouldn't you like this to go with your nice new, you know, rug that you bought? I'm particularly concerned, actually, about the third one. And one, one of the reasons <laughs> is that is both the anthropomorphization and the trust issue there, but also I think people tend to kind of buy into stories in general, whether they're anthropomorphized or not. And I would say that the big concern, probably, in the use case that was being put out in the question was um, if you miss things, right? So, so um, you know, if, if you're trusting this thing to give you what's interesting and relevant to you, and there are things that are out there that are, are not happening, you're just completely unaware, and there's no way for you to even know that things are being missed. This is already kind of happening with Google, by the way, because they are starting to learn your preferences, and they are tailoring your search results mm -hmm. to, to the things you've seen before. So it, it is uh, it's an area of, of high concern, I think. Um, I don't have solutions, but it's out there. And for me, I recently just switched to uh, GoDuckGo instead of like using Google. So I'm not using, I'm not tracked by Google, at least in my, my searches. But I think I just want to piggyback on what Mark's remarks are in terms of the third thing. I also find a little discerning. And I don't know whether there is any specific research with uh, mm -hmm. um, conclusive data on that one. But my intuition would be there, yes, yes there is in certain cases, maybe there's trust more easily formed if you have anthropomorphized agent. But on the other hand, I think they might be easily more, more easily to be broken down if they sort of like start to have mistakes. Or I'm touching this recommendation with this particular agent, this particular log, this particular way of recommending things. Versus, I personally find the way of Amazon or Netflix <coughs> recommend things to be more powerful, more persuasive in the sense of it's not tied to a particular persona. It's tied to this sort of almost omnipresent thing that you don't know where it comes from, but you know it's coming from a lot of data and it's sort of like removed from this sort of like more more human scale kind of recommendation systems. So to me that's sort of, maybe it can be again a two-way situation. Are you going to tell me you have, you have a contract with Amazon? <laughs> no. I, was just, um, I think there's different dimensions that make people interested in things and we can talk about that more later. But I, well, actually, I'll talk about it now. I mean, I, I was really, I really like the, the villains, heroes, princess kind of, and I love these sort of uh, props theory and all these theories about folk tales and, and the general model of themes. I think that's very important. I mean, this is, um, and I think both Mark and Ji Chen talked about how difficult it is for computers to detect these things if they're not explicit in the text. Um, and that's actually something that um, I'm really interested in in the long term. It's not something that the company is working on right now, but thinking about, you know, what are the really big angles of ways to tell the story? And the one that I always keep coming back to, and I, I guess Gladwell just wrote a book about it, is, is you might not care about school reform, but if I can make this school reform uh, story about a David versus Goliath story of a, of a, of a young principal fighting the system, you might get interested in something that you would otherwise not be interested in. And so I think actually identifying sort of big themes, big, big sort of narrative arcs like that that are, that are actually very emotionally uh, compelling to people. And those are the kinds of things that, that they really, um, I mean, I've thought about this even for like TMZ. You know, TMZ's theme is feet of clay. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's something that people are endlessly fascinated by, everybody else's you know, weird little foibles, and, and I don't know why, but they are, you know, so, so it's a, it's a uh, maybe it's schadenfreude, maybe it's, we're all in this together, I don't know what it is, but there's a, there's a, a sense of kinship, you know, right. that, yeah, they're, they're people too or something, but, but that's a great theme that really uh, speaks to people's hearts, and I think that if we want to tell stories that are really going to stick with people, they, they should stick with people's hearts, and, and, 
and I think that's really a, 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 a kind of a big issue. And um, uh, strangely <coughs> enough, Google just gave me a little bit of money to, to think about that, which I was shocked. I mean, I, it was like, it's such a hard problem, but you know, that's what they like to work on, so that's good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around everything. This has been a fascinating panel, but I wanted to sort of glom on to, to um, something salient that I had read in the research literature a couple of weeks ago, which was a new study that came out um, that was looking at uh, whether or not people could tell the difference between an automatically generated story produced by um, automated insights. It was a, uh, a sports recap story. Whether or not people could tell the difference between that and a story written by a human journalist. Uh, and what the result was, was basically they're indistinguishable. Uh, which I think, you know, Mark alluded to this, uh, Reg alluded to this. Um, and, I, and so I just wanted to sort of pose it to the panel of, you know, what kind of media environment, uh, or, or how should the media environment sort of react to this um, coming future where we can't really tell the difference between something that's been written by a human or an algorithm? Are there new ethical questions that we need to sort of tackle as journalists to label our content in certain ways or be transparent in certain ways about how it was generated? You're not asking me, right? You're asking them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, the, the, the tech geek in me and says, hooray, right? Uh, we're doing a good job. But uh, I, guess, I, I guess I'd throw it back and say, well, <clears throat> if we're not misleading, we're not misinforming. I mean, we're actually doing something good job. And people are deriving value from this. Is it actually a problem if we can't tell? Or do people actually want to know the provenance? Of, of where these things come from. I mean, uh, there's so much stuff on the internet, I, you just kind of assume that everyone's a bot out there anyways now. So let me just sort of jump in on this. I mean, to, to, the, end, to the extent that transparency is the new whatever, that's, it's a good thing, right? I mean, I think you should be explaining to people in the same way that you're expecting journalists to explain to some extent at least what their biases are, where they come from, or what stocks they hold, and, and, and that sort of thing. But I think the, the broader question is, you know, if the mission of journalism is to inform people, you know, accurately and, and about the world they live in, and it happens to be done in some cases better than machines, I mean, what's the problem here? Um, you know, it's a problem for journalists in terms of staying employed, um, but then that just means we have to find some other value we have to bring to, you know, to the table. You know, the one thing I would say is that what, what begins to matter more is the provenance of the data, because if the stories are being generated automatically from data, then you want to know who is the data supplier and are they a, are they a reliable data supplier. I think that becomes, that becomes much more the, the, the issue. That, that we want right. to, because it, 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 normally the, the model would be if it was written by a human being, the human being is standing behind the data. But if it's written by a machine, then there's some other process that's standing behind the data, and I think we want to at least know who, who that is corporately. And for me, I'm going to comment less on the ethical issue, but more in terms of I'm totally wholeheartedly doing the whole way here. In the sense, if a machine can do the things that do the groundwork for us, and if that means that we're going to free more of the journalists, can do more interesting things that's going to be tailored to different audiences, for instance, or Absolutely. if that means that's going to be more Ira Glass out there, I'm totally up for it. Absolutely. Or driving cabs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to change the pace a little bit and ask a uh, formalist narratological question, which is that all of you, to some extent, have modeled the problem from the perspective of the storyteller. How do you express the story in a way that seems to make sense going from A to Z in some kind of uh, discourse, some kind of uh, argumentational structure? Uh, but a story is a transaction between a model teller and a model receiver. And I want to kind of flip it on its head and say, what would happen if you instead of thinking about how the story should be told, thought about how the story should be received. And Mark, you mentioned this briefly with this project about being able to simulate when you would understand suspense. Um, I kind of want all of you to, I would like to hear all of your perspectives on that, especially with the narrative science. Um, you have a process of trying to express a story with a lead and then supporting evidence. And obviously there's um, an understanding of the way that the reader will receive the story that's built into those rules. But what would happen if you instead built a system where the receiver was an agent, and you could actually simulate uh, what's known about the story, what questions are being generated by the reader, how long they're kept in suspense, whether they feel like the, the lead has been buried, 
and, and sort of what their emotional progression is through the story. How would that kind of approach work out? Well, it, um, it actually ties into the, 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 the first question we had, which is this personalization aspect, and which is I believe that these systems absolutely have to take the reader into account and all the, the various psychological processes that go on, their preferences, their interests, their desires, their needs even. And so you alluded, I have an, um, one of my recent PhD students who just defended built a system that can fill suspense. Right, so he's trying to get, figure out what, how, how can we simulate the response that an average person might have to a particular story. And then once that works, then we can filter through all the different stories. I can tell it this way, you'll get this reaction. I can tell it this way, I'll get this reaction. Obviously, this extends well beyond suspense because you, know, you might be in a more factual storytelling environment. You, maybe you actually want suspense because you want people eyes on your uh, document longer. But I think you know, if we're ignoring the reader, then we're never going to do a very good job in the long run of serving uh, our eventual end users. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good question. I think there are researchers who are working exactly on that problem. And also I want to complicate a little more. So in addition to sort of the more authorial point of view and then the, the reader's point of view, I think there's somewhere in the middle, which is both Mark and I working on. It is a new sort of AI algorithm called Experience Manager. Right, in a sense, it's a sort of like what is the model from the author's point of view in terms of what kind of experience you want your mm. user to have. So it's sort of like somewhere, not necessarily directly measuring what happens in the, in the user's perspective, but it is sort of like from authority point of view in terms of this is the kind of experience I want the user to have rather than this is a story I want to tell. You're absolutely right. Um, that having been said, there are of course standard kinds of questions and standard kinds of models for those questions that people have, especially in professional settings where there's a sort of a standard practice that people have around these things. And there are st therefore standard narrative forms that are associated with addressing those questions in the way that people typically do. Now you're right that there will be a variance and you can imagine all kinds of measures like how many questions am I making this poor guy keep in his head at one time or, or, or things like that. And I could, I could certainly think about that. Um, but in general, I mean, uh, to me, this goes back to sort of deconstructing existing narrative practice, which is to say that good writers understand these things, obviously, and have crafted over the years. Uh, uh, I mean, th this is not just something people do to know well every time they write a story. I mean, there are narrative forms that have evolved to meet these needs. And, and so I guess my answer would be let's, let's start there because there's something concrete we can look at in terms of how we're, we're going to we're going to get to this. You know, what I am reminded of is at one point we thought we would write a sports story like this where we would start with the, uh, the most, uh, the place in the game where things were most, could have gone either way the most. You know, it's we're blah, 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 we're at the stage and this happens, dot, dot, dot. How did we get here? And then go back to the beginning of the game and go to the lead out and then finally in the middle of the story go back and, and, um, and uh, say what happened as a way of sort of doing a, a sort of, this is a hackneyed model of suspense, frankly, but it's one you, we've seen all the time. I mean, a million stories are written that way. And Templon, who's, you know, really cares about sports, he said, this is terrible. This is a sports story written for somebody who doesn't care about sports. I don't need somebody to heighten the tension for me. The tension is inherent in, the, in my caring about this, uh, about what really happened here. So please don't do that to anybody, you know, but we did think about it. But I think that's because in that case, your use case was people who needed to know the, the results, right? Right, and, absolutely. And everything else is secondary. I mean, there, is, there are longer form um, editorials that actually are more like histories. Absolutely. They kind of tell you the history of Silicon right. Valley. No, you could have two versions, right? right? This is the version for people who care about sports, and these are the people who right. are stuck having to listen to a sports story. So, but then, <laughs> absolutely. Right. But that gets back to the greater point is you really need to know what the communicative information need absolutely. of your user is, and you might have to just completely rewrite or not even write until, you know, just in time write it. You know, yeah, absolutely. Just in time. Needs. Absolutely. But I think this is a great question in the sense of it captures the dichotomy between almost like a pre-20th century literary criticism in the sense of whether basically you're studying the author versus sort of more of the reader's response theory in the sense of the, the meaning of the text is in the beholder, in the reader, rather than what is, what is meant to convey from the author's point of view. So I think definitely we need to have both of the, more of the top-down point of view from the authorial control versus the more bottom-up, which is in terms of what we want the reader, the reader to get out of this, what kind of experience you want them to have. 
and it also brings into relief the difference between fiction and journalism right because a lot of what we heard today was fiction but you have a completely different goal of what you want the reader experience to be than you do in journalism as you as you were mentioning thank you thank you Hi, um, I was just thinking about uh, practical applications for all of the tools that you all mentioned up here for news. And really the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, forward-looking statements. You know, those are the statements that companies you know, mention in their press releases, you know, we may use the word can, we, you know, might, something might happen, but might not necessarily happen, so, you know, don't sue us if it doesn't. It's incredibly important for traders because they want to know what's going to happen in the future is what they, you know, base their expectations on whether to buy or sell. It seems like we're, the technology in terms of where it stands now is we're very good at automating things like data releases where you know a number shows up in a PDF at the same place every time, once a week, once a month, you take it, you can structure, uh, have a computer language structure a story around that very easily. Uh, but, but when it comes to, you know, what well, CEOs... Not that easy, but yeah. Well, right, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of forward-looking statements, you know, uh, for example, our, a lot of my colleagues, I work at Reuters with, with Reg, and I, a lot of our uh, uh, colleagues still, you know, will dial in and listen, and if they hear the CEO say something will happen, might, you know, uh, we're still doing that by hand, whereas it seems like customers will more and more be demanding that that get automated as well. So I'm just wondering if you all think some of these tools could be used for that? Well, I, actually, for one thing, they probably want to hear his voice. I mean, I'm, I mean uh, there's still data that have not been entirely, you know, captured, and, and I'm sure the reporters not only want to hear the exact m modal uh, uh, verb that the, that, the, uh, that the CEO uses, but, the, you know, the way he says it. And, um, but, you know, uh, gosh, that's coming too, you know, so. You know, he sounds uncertain. Uncertain, you know, and there'll be a number. Well, I imagine there, there's a process where they come up with these things, right? They're doing some sort of forward extrapolation from existing data, and, and these are things that certainly, if you're just dealing with numbers and trajectories of numbers, computers can start to do some of this stuff. But what I'm, I, it reminds me more of, uh, say, meteorology, right? Where you actually have many different models and many different possible forecasts that can be made because you have many different models and they all disagree with each other. And there's one voice that has to really kind of synthesize. synthesize or pick the one that they think is the one that ultimately goes on the air. And so I don't think it's the forecasting that's the problem. And whether you hedge it or not is it's just word choice. But it's the synthesis um, that I think will be the, the most, the value uh, added to this. Yeah, I'm thinking about the counterfactuals and it's, um if you guys have a product, we all want a piece of it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just have a quick follow-up? You know, what about testing for accuracy once you develop a model? Because one of the other things is transcription. You know, CEOs will blur words and they'll say things that aren't very audible. Is that something that the computer science can you know, help us out with in a way that we can actually do this in the near future? Uh, not me, but yes. Right. I mean, I don't think anybody on, not, not really anybody at this table, but absolutely, I'm sure, you know. We've talked about uh, the personalization bubble where we might not be aware of things outside of our interests. And I thought about another bubble. Uh, I want to ask you about the missing data. So what about the data bubble? If we don't know that this data set exists or nobody publishes the scores for a particular game, then we might not be able to write about it, right? Or would we write a story that uh, says there was no data? How, how will that be handled? Great question. I mean, if the, uh, right, it's like if the data, did anybody, you know, did it actually happen? I mean, um, so typically speaking, when we, w what we do, we try to write, in some of the systems that we, in some of the areas that we're in, there will be varying levels and quality of data, and we do try to actually, you know, make it that it'll, it, if you have more data, it'll write a better story, and with less data, it'll write a less good story. Um, but, um, but I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, one, actually, one of the nice things about, generating stories from data is that, is that sometimes, you know, in fact, very often people think their data is much better than it actually is. And so one of the great things about, uh, about generating stories from people's data is that all of a sudden they're like, wow, that was, you know, that's much less complete or much noisier than, than, than we thought it was. So that's actually, it's kind of a nice way to, um, one of the benefits of giving voice to data is that um, is that people can hear a little bit more clearly how what their data is like? 
But I think to, to just sort of run that round a little bit more is that, you know, humans write around holes in information all the time. And whether it's, you know, data that's missing on the eighth inning and, you know, just sort of makes it hard to write up the story or that a team's completely missing, or if you crowdsource information and they, you know, miraculously manage to miss out the bit about, you know, holding hands before you kiss, um, you know, what, what happens? How, how, you know, how do you get, if you build a system and then you're missing pieces of it, how do you account for this and what do you do about it? Well, I, th I think the, the standard answer is no data, no story, right? But um, I'm actually glad you asked the question because I've just started up a new project uh, It's funded by Google right now, which is uh, how to take this crowdsourcing notion and incentivize people to go fill those missing gaps. So once you can detect it, can you go get data? So, so Google in particular can detect a lot of things online, but they can't observe a lot of things that are out there in the real world where there aren't cameras or sensors or things like that. Uh, so, so we've been looking at the question of whether we can make um, online mobile games that will incentivize people to go and collect data and put it into the system in the context of going on quests or solving puzzles or things great. like that. That's great. So, so these systems, you know, again, I, I see the synthesis of humans and computers working together because humans are always going to be able to do things that computers can't do. But these computers can also orchestrate humans for the needs that they have. You know, help me get data. Uh, help me refine this story. Uh, help me understand the things I need to talk about. Help me judge whether I'm doing a good job so I can improve myself over time. And I think as the symbiosis goes back and forth, um, uh, we, we have a lot more strength and power through these uh, algorithms. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think I saw that movie. It's called The Matrix. Right? <laughs> 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 the next question. Hi, uh, you guys started to touch on this when you're talking about perturbation and missing data, but I'm curious for the three of you how you think about the role of that which is not known in your work. So for the first two people, um, in terms of the role of sort of chance and serendipity in a story, and so both in terms of a narrative and also in terms of like a character's relative certainty for some sort of atomic knowledge, and then um, I guess the data analytics analog of that is how do you think about, um, you know, if you have uncertainty in your data, how is error propagation and that sort of thing represented in your results? It's a really interesting question. So I feel I'm not really qualified to answer a lot of the previous questions because part of the reason I think one of the gentlemen already talked about, I think for me, my interest is almost completely on the fictional side in the sense of how can we use, how can I use computer algorithms to tell stories that's not a general story, but something that will clearly come from me with my bias, with my ideology, with my value systems. So to me, I don't necessarily see the missing data as necessarily a bad thing. Again, because I'm not going for sort of the more common stories as Mark was saying earlier. For me, missing data in the specific case of my can be a blessing too, in a sense I don't want the story that coming out of my system to be uh, sort of a cookie cutter that will be, fit, that, will be that can be fitted anywhere. So in, my, in our case, for instance, like going back to real system where the character is retrieving memories. So we're not trying to expand the, the number of memories as large as we possibly can to cover all the situations. We're very selectively picking the ones that we find will help to portray the particular message, the kind of artistic vision we want to have. But this question, I think, is different when you sort of see the system, the, see the story generated by system as more of sort of this more subjective interpretation by the artist, by the storyteller, versus if you want to have a system that can be used by many, many different people. I think there's three types of uncertainty here. There's uncertainty in the data. So for example, in my system, it learns from the crowd. And if it has any too much uncertainty about certain things that are happening, it just it does the machine learning thing. It throws it out. And sometimes it makes errors because of it. Um, but hopefully, it's talking mostly about the things that it relies on or is most confident about. The second kind is uncertainty in the fictional world. So we often read stories, fictional stories, um, in which characters are uncertain or you know something strange or serendipitous happens and it casts them into you know a, a, an internal struggle or resolves their problems deus ex machina sort of thing the second type of, of uncertainty doesn't actually exist because our systems are the authors so whether that person gets into a car crash or not 
is not left but up to the randomness of traffic. The author gets to decide whether they get in the car crash and whether they survive or not. But we can create the appearance of uncertainty in the reader. And that's the third type of uncertainty, which is a, you call it an editorial decision or call it an authorial decision. Do we want the reader to feel anxiety or uncertainty? Or do we want them to actually not know what's going on because we want them to fill in the missing gaps or, or to, hmm. to question what, what's going to happen next? So we can break these out into three different categories and we can reason about them in very different ways. I mean, it's a real, it's an issue for us, absolutely. I mean, you want to think about um, uh, possible error and error propagation, how you talk about it. it. It depends on the content vertical. So, and by the way, this even shows up in, in, the, in the particular analytic model uh, or, or trope or, or uh, angle that you're going to ascribe to the data um, because there are thresholds in, the, in those, in those the conditions obviously that decide whether, you know, was it a come from behind victory or not? Was it a blowout or not? That would be a better one. And, and you know, and that's, you know, there's a little bit of the eye of the beholder there. Now, you know, you can hedge it. You can say some might have called it a blowout. Um, and in sports, that may or may not matter. You know what? In medicine, it'll, it's really going to matter. If something is close to a threshold where uncertainty is really potentially problematic, then you better actually call it out and make it clear. So I think that there are, uh, again, there are different conventions, narrative conventions, depending on the, on the, on the narrative form and really depending on the use to which the information is going to be put by the, by the reader. Um, and in, in those cases where, you know, someone, a judgment that's going to matter, you know, life or death, for example, then we definitely want to make sure that we express it. So we come back to Nick just at about when we ought to be wrapping up anyway. <laughs> yes, so we are, we are uh, before we thank our speakers and, and wrap up for tonight, uh, one quick announcement and then one quick question that came in over Twitter uh, for specifically for Larry. Um, so announcement, uh, the next uh, computational journalism uh, event will be March 25th. Uh, that's Tuesday week after next. Simon Rogers will be visiting. Uh, he's a data journalist at Twitter. Um, he'll be here to tell us about what it's like uh, telling uh, journalistic stories uh, using billions of tweets. Uh, so come out for that. It's at 6.30 uh, p.m. Um, here in the Journalism School in the Stabile Center. Uh, and then one final question for Larry that came in over Twitter uh, from Marco van Kirkhoven. Uh, the question is, is there any final human editing involved before a software-generated story goes online? Um, during QA, yes, obviously, when we're actually developing um, um, mechanisms for doing it. But uh, typically, as long as, the, um, as long as the people getting the stories trust the data source, the answer is no. But if they don't, sometimes. But, but in general, no. Final word is no from Larry. Thank you. That's right. All right. That's a good word to end on. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you, Nick and Reg, again for hosting us. We appreciate it. Great. And thanks to everyone for coming out tonight.